live from KSAT 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. The legal whiplash is real. We begin tonight with that back and forth over a new Texas immigration law. Yeah, yesterday at 6, we told you the law known as SB4 was in effect, and it was until late last night. So let's break this whole thing down. Here's what happened this week. On Monday at 4 p.m., the U.S. Supreme Court extended an already existing pause on the law. And then the next morning, the Supreme Court lifted that pause. The justices kicked it back to an appeals court because of a procedural error related to the pause. That meant the law went into effect in Texas at 4 p.m. on Tuesday. But fast forward a couple of hours after that yesterday, and the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled the pause would stay in effect. That brings us to today. This morning, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals heard arguments on whether to allow Texas to enforce this law. But also today, while speaking at a policy summit in Austin, Governor Greg Abbott said the state does not need SB4 to arrest people for crossing the border. What they have stayed is the Texas enforcement of SB4. But even without SB4, Texas has the legal authority to arrest people coming across the razor wire barriers on our border. Even though the law is blocked right now, people here are waiting for the courts to make a decision in all this. And they're telling our Daniela Ibarra they're worried about what this law will mean for them. The journey to cross the border was risky. With organized crime plaguing his home country of Ecuador, Edison says staying was even more dangerous. He says if he didn't come, he'd be a dead man. Edison says law enforcement have treated him with respect as he seeks asylum. He's worried SB4 could change that. He says it's a killer law. It would give state and local law enforcement the authority to arrest migrants they suspect crossed into the state illegally. Governor Abbott believes it will help stop migrants from coming. Texas has a right to defend ourselves, and we will use that authority to declare an invasion and fight back against that invasion. I don't think it's constitutional. I don't think it's right. Joseph Morales is Hispanic. Um, he worries about the possibility of being racially profiled. I think it, this is going to make things worse. Um, I think that uh, we need unity. I think it's going to divide a lot of people and it's going to make people uncomfortable. What are you hearing from your clients? Fear. Uh, certainly fear. Lance Kurtwright is a San Antonio based immigration attorney. Why are people so nervous about this law? This is a very scary law. It's going to dramatically change the way immigration law is enforced in the state of Texas. With the laws back and forth in the courts, he says clients want to know what to do if they get caught up in it. Well, that depends. Uh, if they're here subsequent to a lawful entry, they should have evidence of that. Otherwise, they should speak to their lawyer about that. And in any case, when you're arrested, you always have the right to remain silent and you should exercise those rights. Edison says he just wants to find work. Nos denigran a nosotros. Sí, no es justo, no es correct. He calls the law denigrating, adding that it's not just or fair. Daniela Ibarra. KSAT 12 News. From social media to a city park, people showing their grief in response to the deaths of a local woman and her three-year-old son. People have begun leaving balloons and flowers at Tom Slick Park, not far from the ditch where investigators found the bodies of 32-year-old Savannah Krieger and her son Caden yesterday morning. Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar told news crews it appeared both had been shot and that Savannah was the suspect. The news came as a shock to people everywhere, including in their neighborhood. We've all probably seen her, and I think a lot of people actually know her. And it just, having children makes you just sick to your stomach. According to the sheriff, Savannah Krieger was involved in a custody battle over her son. He says the investigation regarding their deaths is still ongoing. There will be no change of venue in the trial for a former San Antonio police officer. James Brennan is the ex-officer who shot a teen outside of a McDonald's in 2022. Eric Contu was that teenager sitting in his car when Brennan opened the door. As Contu tried to drive away, Brennan shot him several times. He survived, but this case got national attention and Brennan was eventually arrested and charged. His attorneys tried to move the case to a different county, but today a judge denied that motion. 
It's not the decision we wanted from the judge, but again, the facts are the facts. They don't change. The law is the law, and it doesn't change. And we believe that if any jury, including a Bear County jury, hears those facts, that they'll see that Mr. Brennan was justified. The case now moves forward to trial, and a tentative date has been set for November. The fallout from what some are calling an embarrassing independent investigation into the Uvalde Police Department is continuing. Almost two weeks ago, investigator Jesse Prado cleared all officers of wrongdoing in their response to the shooting at Robb Elementary. Last week, the city council asked for more time in assessing that report, sparking renewed outrage. Lee Waldman spoke with Brett Cross, who just wrapped up a week long sit in protest in response, hoping to inspire accountability. Still out here. It doesn't matter how bad it gets, how windy, how much rain, how much lightning. We're still out here. Through the wind, rain, and cold temperatures, Brett Cross kept his word, staying outside the Uvalde Police Department headquarters, demanding accountability. I'm glad to be away, but you know, unfortunate that I didn't get what I, you know, what I absolutely wanted. On X, he laid that out in videos and posts, calling for three officers who were among the first to respond to Rob Elementary on May 24th to resign or be fired. Next week will be two weeks since they got that report. What are you hoping comes of that next city council meeting? I'm hoping that they, they do what is right and actually, you know, disapprove that, that report so that we can actually make meaningful change. At this point, those officers, Lieutenant Javier Martinez, Sergeant Eduardo Canales, and Detective Luis Landry have not faced any disciplinary actions. UPD Assistant Chief Homer Delgado met with Cross every day of his protest. Mr. Cross, we support you 100%. Um, personally, I respect his resolve in, in, in what he decided to do, um, and I'll, I'll tell him directly, I heard you. Delgado explained protocols need to be followed before any action can be taken against UPD officers. According to our policies that we follow, um, it all depends on what happens with the Prado investigation. The independent investigative report on the Robb Elementary shooting was met with anger from families of victims and survivors, as well as some city council members, because it called for all officers' names to be exonerated. Delgado says, he finds issues with the report as well. I can't honestly say that I'm completely comfortable with it. Uh, there are some issues that I have concerns about. I, there are things that I would like to, to be straightened out. So if, if we do ever have an opportunity to discuss it, um, I would definitely ask some questions. Cross hopes that opportunity comes at the next Uvalde City Council meeting on March 26th. We have to keep fighting. And Uvalde, Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. All right, a very strange day. Another day where you're just, like, please rain. Yeah, it's just so do gray something. out there. Either rain or get out of here, <laughs> Do something. Yeah. Right? If you're not going to provide us with some needed moisture, at least give us a little uh, sunshine. But no, today the deceiving clouds, they, you know, they, they were teasing us. They looked like they would drop rain in any moment, but just a few sprinkles, that's it. And kept our temperatures down. North Texas in the 70s around here, we were in the 60s, 65 officially for the high temperature here in San Antonio. And that's 11 degrees below average for this time of year. We, we do have some warmer days ahead. Tomorrow back in the low 70s, Friday up to 80 degrees. This weekend into early next week we will be well into the 70s. So back to more seasonable conditions. I do want to point out all the cloud covers really thickening as it streams overhead and some energy starting to move in from Mexico and the desert southwest. We're going to talk more about our storm chances with this system in just a bit. All right, thanks, Adam. I know we always need more rain, but take a look at this view out here. 281 in San Pedro, the thing that stands out to me, how green it is <laughs> at the moment. Traffic slow going northbound, but no major accidents to tell you about. It's the city's animal shelter, and a city audit found San Antonio's Animal Care Services has not had enough oversight of some of its rescue partners. The audit was focused on the eight rescue groups that ACS had paying contracts with last year. Garrett Berger asked the department what it's changing. 
San Antonio Animal Care Services partners with hundreds of rescue groups, which last budget year took more than 9,400 animals out of the city shelter. About half went to a few groups that were paid for every animal they took. It was those eight contracts at the center of a recent city audit. So some of the things they said in there that sounded alarming at first, it's really not. We're doing the work, we're just not documenting the work. ACS says it asked for the audit which found issues including how it gathered paperwork and how it actually monitored the outcome of the pulled animals. Bottom line from this audit, did animals fall through the cracks because of the issues raised in this audit? No, I don't think so. Our animals were spayed and neutered, our animals are well cared for. We have great partners that have uh, that do tremendous work in our community. In a sample of 17 animals that left ACS custody, Auditors weren't able to get proof of sterilization for three of them. ACS says it sterilizes most pets that leave its campus, but some are too young or in too bad of shape. We trust them. We have long-standing relationships with many of them. They're spaying and neutering their pets. If they get a pet puppy that's too young, it's just that we need to go back and check with them afterwards. But the audit also found that outside of its biggest partner, San Antonio Pets Alive, which has a presence on its campus, ACS isn't regularly inspecting the other seven or requesting monthly status reports. Auditors said ACS should perform periodic inspections for all rescue partners. We are going to do various random inspections, audit our partners, but the aid is what we are primarily concerned with because we have a paid contract with them. ACS said it has cut ties with five unpaid rescue groups in the past year. The department agreed to all the audit's findings in December, and the audit was accepted at a recent committee meeting without any discussion. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. A San Antonio defense attorney says the Bear County District Attorney's Office dragged its feet for months in handing over evidence and was untruthful about its reasons for dismissing a DWI charge against a key witness in her client's prostitution case. Records show an elevated DWI charge against that woman was dismissed last year despite her having a blood alcohol limit nearly three times the legal limit and at least five pretrial violations. While prosecutors have told attorney Carolyn Wetland that the dismissal had nothing to do with the woman's prior testimony, case had investigates obtained records that appear to dispute that claim. There was a lot of manipulation of the system in this case. In just a few minutes, case had takes a closer look at this case and what impact this revelation could have at trial. And coming up next, a local doctor is back in San Antonio after climbing one of the world's tallest mountains to raise awareness for kidney donation. Why she says donating, donating an organ doesn't need to limit your lifestyle. And taking a live look outside with live cam, it's going to be damp and drizzly overnight, but how much real rainfall could we get? Meteorologist Adam Kasky with your full forecast after the break. She did it. We have been following the journey of a university health doctor who scaled Mount Kilimanjaro to show that organ donation doesn't limit your lifestyle. Yeah, boy, did she prove that she reached the summit a week ago on World Kidney Day. Courtney Friedman got to meet up with her today on her first day back to work in the lab. Yeah. Was it negative? Oh, it's negative. Dr. Kelly Hitchman is back in her lab at University Hospital, but just days ago, she was here at the summit of Mount Kilimanjaro, the tallest freestanding mountain in the world. We were six and a half days to the summit and a day and a half back down. This is Barranco Wall. This is that 800 foot vertical. So you can't see it here, but those are like little people scaling, scaling the wall. She did it to prove a life-saving point that you can donate an organ and still live life without limits. In 2021, Hitchman donated a kidney to a complete stranger. For 14 years, she's led a team that looks for compatible transplant patients and donors. She's seen her patients suffer. It's got to be terribly frightening. Uh, and then to go on the deceased donor wait list and be told that the average wait time in the nation is five to seven years has to be unbelievably daunting. That's why this team of 13 kidney donors and one surgeon climbed Kilimanjaro for the 100,000 patients on the donor wait list. And I can say without a doubt, donating a kidney is far easier than climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. You can donate and still have a full life. Absolutely, absolutely. A full life with no additional medication, no dietary changes, no changes to your physical fitness routine, no limits. She hopes people can see 
donating an organ has truly brought her strength, her abilities, and her purpose to unwavering new heights. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. The doctor said she wanted to shout it from the mountaintop. She did. Now, if this story gets you thinking about donating or you've decided to do it, we have a two different links on our website that we'd like you to look at. Just find this story. Mm, big congratulations. That's yeah. Amazing. Yeah, I, I bet donating an organ much easier than climbing yep. Mount Kilimanjaro. That would be an intense journey. Well, you have to acclimatize as you go up. That's the problem. That's I, how did I know elements. that he would he would know what? It That's is. why it takes five days to go up. You have to get to these certain camps, let okay, your body so you adjust wait a little bit. Yeah. OK, unless you're Wim Hof or one of his followers, the Iceman, and he's he does it in his shorts and just shoes and that's it. And he's got a special breathing technique and he can bypass the acclimatization. But that's, that's why it takes six days to get up and a day and a half to get down. Yes, traditionally. Yeah. I'm yeah. just going off on a tangent here Yeah, because I, I love the Iceman. That's what this portion of the show is all about. OK, and, let's, and a forecast. Here we go. We're going to get to the forecast. <laughs> Plenty of clouds out there right now. They're a little deceptive, though. They're teasing us. Oh, uh, Wim, Wim Hof. Oh, Wim Hof. Yeah. Sorry. The Read his book. Read his book, Wim Hof, and uh, you'll learn about his methods and uh, it's sign and actual university studies on the man. It's it's fascinating. What, Very cool. Yeah. And people, it's been vetted by journalists too. Skeptical ones. Anyway, <laughs> rain chances. Let's get back to it. Steve's so good at woo, veering me off the road a little bit. Uh, 40% chance tonight, and that's mainly for the showers. Drizzle's about 100% chance. Not much to show for it. Tomorrow afternoon, 30% chance of storms popping up. And then early Monday morning, we have another 30% chance. So unfortunately, nothing too significant when it comes to rainfall potential. Authority radar has a few little faint echoes out there, especially east of town and a little bit in the hill country. This is still mainly mid-level cloud cover that's being detected by the radar. Basically some droplets up in the clouds, but no real rain. Here's a look at those clouds again, and they're thickening up and they'll continue to thicken as we go through the evening and tonight. And then the drizzle and sprinkles gradually set in. Let's get the big picture. We go into West Texas, some activity de detected by radar. Marfa recently reporting light rain, but the air is very dry out there. So a lot of this evaporates before it hits the ground. Beautiful area though. Love, love West Texas. Justin Horn was just in Big Bend National Park for spring break and oh, had a good time. Loved it. It's a must see for everybody around here. Anyway, back on the road again, this upper level dip near Phoenix. That's our disturbance. It teamed up with another one in the Pacific headed our way. It's going to give us the Drizzle and sprinkles tonight, just overall dampness through the morning commute tomorrow. And then we'll actually have a little bit of sunshine midday. Look at our future cast after the morning commute. The sky clears out a little bit and we'll have sunshine in the middle part of the day, which will help to destabilize the atmosphere a bit and give us a slight chance of storms late in the afternoon and through the evening hours. The window of opportunity or potential is 5 p.m. to 11 p.m. tomorrow anywhere across South Central Texas. Overall rainfall accumulations will be limited though. Most of us a few hundredths of an inch to a quarter of an inch farther east you are of San Antonio, the higher your potential because the rain will be a little more organized closer to Gonzales, Cuero, Hallettsville and even points eastward. 64 right now, dew point of 55. Temperatures in the 60s locally, some 70s off to the north. That's where we actually have sunshine in North Texas, but around here the clouds keeping us in the 60s. Stray sprinkles, a little bit of patchy drizzle developing over the next few hours. We'll start the day with that tomorrow at 58. By noon, some sunshine at 68 and then 73 for the high temperature around town. Some mid 70s south and east, Divine 75, Floresville 75. And then by Friday, nothing but sunshine and 80 and a comfortable weekend. Mixture of sun and clouds and in the 70s. The countdown is on 19 days to the total solar eclipse. Your next fact at 645. Almost here. Thank you, Adam. All right, this is a young man who has been on NFL rosters before. He was a high draft pick. Yeah. Is he going to get back on a roster? Well, Kellen Mond from uh, right here in San yeah. Antonio went to Reagan High School. He definitely wants to get back on an NFL roster. That's exactly why he took part in the Texas A&M Aggies recent Pro Day. Yes, Pro Day Part 2 for Mond. And you know what? The Texas Rangers have named their opening day starter. 
We got it coming up. Smile, boys. Amen. Good catch. Brock Cunningham is taking pictures of what appears to be a Kodak Fun Saver camera ahead of the Horns' first round game tomorrow night in Big Board Sports. Former Texas A&M quarterback Kellen Mond participated in the Aggies Pro Day earlier this week. Now, this is video from Aggies Pro Day back in 2021. Mond, who went to Reagan High School before transferring to IMG Academy in Florida, was selected by the Vikings in the third round in the 2021 NFL Draft. He spent one season there and has since bounced around joining the Browns and the Colts. Mond has a great reason for throwing the ball around again at Aggies Pro Day. Uh, just get in front of more scouts and get in front of, you know, different eyes and um, just obviously try to continue my journey in the NFL. You know, it's kind of funny, you know, just being back with a lot of the guys and we're like, this is exactly who our 2020 team was with Anias and Chap and JP back. But uh, just a, another opportunity, get a good workout in and be able to throw to the guys. Mon also said he's been working out and communicating with teams. Colorado State Rams beat the Virginia Cavaliers last night, 67-42 for their first NCAA tournament win since 2013. Joel Scott had 23 points and 11 rebounds to help the Rams blow out the Cavs in the first four. Now the Rams have faced the Texas Longhorns, who last played a week ago today when they lost to Kansas State in the Big 12 tourney. So what's it like for the Horns to face a team on short notice? We've been scouting since uh, you know since the tournament came out and selection show Sunday, but really our effort has been put towards getting better as a team. We didn't know who we were going to play until last night, but it's similar to the Big 12 tournament. Of course, you play those guys before, but one day prep, Saturday, Big Monday, we've been preparing for it all season. That's part of March basketball, so we have to adapt. Yeah, Brock said it all right there. Um, just like Saturday, Mondays in the Big 12, we were lucky enough to play, I think, three of those this season, so we have a little bit of experience with um, quick turnarounds, one day preps. Um, so so if we continue to stick to our game plan, come out, play hard, then we, we feel like we'll put ourselves in good position to have success. Number 10, Colorado State and number 7, Texas, will play tomorrow at 5.50 p.m. at the Spectrum Center in Charlotte, North Carolina. And number 6, Texas Tech, will take on number 11, NC State, tomorrow night at 8.40 at PPG Paints Arena in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Big game, Nate will start an opening day for the Texas Rangers as they begin defense of their World Series title. This will be the fourth opening day start for Nathan Evaldi, with the other three coming for the Boston Red Sox. Evaldi's been sharp this spring, and now he'll get ready to face the Chicago Cubs on opening day. Rangers skipper Bruce Bochy told Nate back in December he'd get the opening day nod. Uh, I mean, it was over a phone call, and Bochy said, you know, as long as I stay healthy. You know, that I would have opening day and I think that's the main thing is making sure that I stayed healthy. I think we all know, you know, the little hiccups that occur during spring training and that can happen. But, um, you know, fortunately right now I've been feeling really good mechanically, body wise and everything's been feeling great. Yeah, I mean, anytime you get that honor to be able to start out the season, uh, you know, start that first game, it's a huge honor. And Third baseman Josh Young is coming back from a low-grade calf strain. He's taken live batting practice, and Bruce Bochy thinks Josh will be ready by opening day one week from tomorrow. Hope so. Me too. i got to defend. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Larry. Yep. Case that investigates is up next. Did the Bear County District Attorney's Office dismiss a DWI charge in exchange for a woman's testimony in an unrelated case? A defense attorney is accusing prosecutors of being untruthful about their decision to dismiss. She also says they have not properly handed over evidence in her client's case. Case that investigates Dylan Collier walks us through the records. <laughs> In November 2017, Jarvis Anderson and his younger brother, Lawrence Jackson, were charged with human trafficking, accused of forcing two teenage girls into prostitution, a scheme investigators say was exposed after one of the girls fled from this Northside hotel and alerted her family, who then contacted police. We are not identifying her. While Jackson pled no contest in 2022 and was sentenced to 10 years in prison, Anderson continues to fight for his freedom. His four count indictment reduced to two counts after prosecutors refiled the charges in late 2022. 
His attorney, Carolyn Wintland, argued in court this month that San Antonio police conducted a flawed investigation and evidence should be tossed, in part because officers entered and searched the hotel room without a warrant. The days-long hearing included several heated exchanges between Wintland and visiting Judge Jefferson Moore. Is it evidence, Judge, and you, you have stop, to watch it. Stop, stop, stop talking. Look, I'm not hearing or seeing anything that's relevant. Wentland telling KSAT during a break, she feels the cards have been stacked against her. Yes. Judge, it's all relevant. No, no. Take a seat then. Take a seat. I disagree. Take a seat. Wentland said the case against Anderson has been hampered by discovery issues for months. Specifically, that prosecutors dragged their feet on handing over their correspondence with SAPD. Records confirm the second alleged victim in this case, who we are also not identifying, was accused of driving drunk when she collided with a San Antonio Fire Department ambulance in February 2021. She was unable to recite the alphabet at the scene at a blood alcohol content of 0.21, nearly three times the legal limit to drive a vehicle racked up five pretrial violations for not calibrating her in-home alcohol monitoring device and for skipping tests, and was cited six weeks after the DWI crash on several charges, including marijuana possession, in an unrelated incident in which she was seen by police driving the wrong way on a one-way street. Despite all of these issues, her DWI case was dismissed last March. It was always, always, always told to me by the state that there had been never any agreement with, with her cooperation, that there was nothing, nothing, nothing that we needed to be aware of, that the trafficking case where she supposedly was a victim of was not connected to the dismissal, which happened on a very bad DWI. But judicial dialogue notes obtained by KSAT following a public records request tell a different story. March 6, 2023, the same day her DWI case was dismissed, a DA staffer wrote that he spoke with CH and JG, First Assistant District Attorney Christian Henriksen and District Attorney Joe Gonzalez. Quote, we all agree that the case should be dismissed. Defendant was very helpful in a human trafficking case that resulted in prison time for that defendant an apparent reference to her cooperation in the Jackson case months earlier. The staffer also noted the arresting officer in the DWI had not seen the woman driving, could not perform standard field sobriety tests, and did not get her signature on the blood draw consent form. Wintland says the prosecution was simply not truthful. It clearly indicates that there's a connection there. The DA's office did not respond to repeated requests from us about its decision to dismiss the 2021 DWI case. At last check, Judge Moore had not ruled on Wintland's motion to suppress evidence. Her client is scheduled to be back in court on Friday. For KSAT Investigates, I'm Dylan Collier. In Toilet News at 6, according to a new report from the FBI, crime rates in the U.S. actually dropping. The new data is from approximately 13,000 law enforcement agencies that police more than 80% of the country. The FBI says crime declined significantly in the fourth quarter of last year in almost every category, including murder, violent crime, and property crime. The drop continues a downward trend since the pandemic. Boeing will report a massive loss in the first quarter stemming from the January 5th Alaska Airlines door plug blowout. Boeing's chief financial officer shared the news at an investor conference today. The company said its commercial airplane units operating profit margin will plunge to around negative 20%. That would be the biggest loss margin for the unit in two years. Happening tomorrow, our latest episode of Know My Neighborhood heading to the city's northeast side. Tomorrow, right here on the news at 6, we'll be highlighting the neighborhoods of Northern Hills and Valencia. Here's a preview of tomorrow's episode. Everything is close by. I don't want to live downtown San Antonio. I want to live out in the outskirts, and this is just right. Look at a big map of the city. Look for the green spaces. This is one of those big green spaces. And if you want a place to raise a family that's safe and nice, this is a great neighborhood to be in. Although we don't have a lot of children here right now, I think we're going to see more growth. 
dis disregard for other people's property. I don't like that. Find something else to do with your time. We uh, do have younger kids in the neighborhood. I get anxious when cars are driving down our road. And I know the cops are very busy, but they do not come through here and patrol very often. We put on a lot of fun events, you know, for the community, and we just don't often have the turnout that I think we could have. We have a fabulous senior center. I come every day of the week. I exercise three days a week over there, and then I play Rummy Cube five days a week. For us to have this here, to live here with this, it's a well-kept secret. Outside of that, though, we don't. We don't have a whole lot. Sometimes we'll have to drive a little bit further to go to some of the other parks. Family and community is what relationships are what life is about. Know My Neighborhood, Northern Hills in Valencia airs tomorrow night right here on the News at 6. You can also watch it on the KSAT YouTube channel, KSAT Plus, or any way you stream us. Look forward to it. Up next, students at Northside ISD putting their teamwork and critical thinking to the test by stepping outside of the classroom. The challenge these students are taking on after the break. This week, more than 2,600 Northside ISD students in the gifted and talented program competing for an, in, an outdoor challenge. That's going to test them in many ways. Tiffany Huerta shows us how they have to work together to complete these challenges. And as the game begins, there are a lot of obstacles they will face. We are. All right. Welcome to Station I. For today's challenge, Northside ISD students will go through 17 different stations, testing their teamwork. Whoever wants to cut in the back and forward, uh, I'll cut. And critical thinking skills. Wait, don't we need to use a paper clip? This is Survivor GT. We're getting deep into the forest. Third, fourth, and fifth grade students from across the district must work together to make it to the end. The stations are filled with nature, creativity, and problem-solving challenges. It's getting crazy right now. Welcome to Station J. Get ready for an exciting challenge that brings back the concept of systems to life. Using the provided materials, you're going to work as a tribe to balance a craft stick on a tribe member's finger for 30 seconds. Students must collect items that are really important in this game. Remember, guys, we're looking for tree mail. It could be green or brown tree mail. Oh, Eric found tree mail. Tree mail is something you can do as a popsicle stick. For the final challenge, we can exchange it for things to help us. Just like the show Survivor, you all have to build a shelter at the end of the day. So what have you collected so far? We've collected uh, two straws and two rubber bands. <gasps> can we make a tiny one or just like three? I think we're going to make a tiny one because we can connect it like that. We really just wanted to create an equitable experience for our students. Survivor GT encourages students to explore, discover, and deepen their connection to the complexities within our environment. Uh, where are we right now? We're crossing the parking lot to get over to H. Tiffany Huerta's KSAT 12 News. Intense. Yeah. <laughs> Let's take a look outside with live cam. Plenty of clouds out there again today, but not much rain to show for it. Adam Kasky's got your forecast coming up next. Under 20 days now before the total solar eclipse. Yeah, we got big plans around here. Adam Kasky has got the countdown for us. Oh, we just had another meeting today of what we're doing for our coverage on Monday, April 8th. The countdown is on. We're down to 19 days. And here's a fact for you. During totality for the parts of our area that are in totality. The temperature can drop up to 10 degrees, maybe even a little bit more just because this eclipse will be longer in duration than most that we see around here. So we're going to be monitoring the temperature. Justin and I, we've got our instruments. They'll be ready to go. By the way, you can go to KSAT.com for your entire, everything you need to know for the eclipse, the upcoming eclipse across our area, especially the interactive map. That's very important there of the total solar eclipse over our area and where you'll actually have totality. Let's talk rain and storm chances now. Sprinkles and drizzle developing tonight, lasting through the morning commute. Actual rain 
about 40% coverage tonight, the real showers, which will still be light. And then midday tomorrow, a little bit of sunshine, rain chances fall off, only to rise for a few hours in the afternoon and evening, up to 30% for thunderstorms later on in the day. So a damp morning, some sunshine, and then a few pop up thunderstorms later on in the day. Here's the big picture. Plenty of clouds moving in. Not much to show for them over the past few days. A few showers starting to make their way to the ground in parts of West Texas. They could use the rain too. main driving force is this upper level counterclockwise swirl near Phoenix and Tucson. That's headed our way. It's got a little extra burst of energy from the Pacific as well, and that'll help us out a little bit. It's not going to give us a whole lot, so don't get your hopes too high, but a little bit of moisture better than nothing. Here's a look at our future cast and the low clouds turning into drizzly dampness with a few light showers mixed in off and on overnight tonight, but we're talking a few hundredths of an inch to a tenth of an inch overnight. Then we get into midday tomorrow. Sky clears out a little bit. That will actually help to destabilize the atmosphere. We get that energy from the sun. We warm up and the atmosphere starts to become a little more unstable as the burst of energy moves overhead. That could be just enough to kickstart a few thunderstorms. Futurecast has them starting in the hill country around sunset, but don't pay close attention to the exact placement here anywhere. You see here on the map, we could have a few thunderstorms popping up, but here's the key. Anything that develops does run the risk of becoming strong to severe. Storm Prediction Center has us in a category two of five, five being widespread, two being isolated to scattered in nature with localized hail and a few wind gusts up to 60 miles per hour being the primary threat. And that is between about 5 p.m and 11 p.m. tomorrow. Rainfall potential though on the low end. Most neighborhoods between a few hundredths of an inch to a quarter of an inch. The exception is farther east of San Antonio. You get to Hallettsville, Gonzales, half to three quarters of an inch, and of course Houston where it's going to be more organized between an inch and two inches. But around here we're looking at most rain gauges with under a quarter of an inch, which is unfortunate because this is where we're the driest. Drought monitor, which will be updated tomorrow, still has a good chunk of our area in the extreme drought. So 58 degrees, 7, 8 a.m. drizzle and sprinkles. That action comes to an end by 10 a.m. Noon, a little bit of sunshine at 68. And then by the afternoon and early evening, 5 p.m. to about 11 p.m., a few isolated pop-up thunderstorms possible. Back in the 70s tomorrow, though, we've been in the low 60s the past few days, mid 60s today. 70s tomorrow, 80 degrees and sunny as we get into Friday and this weekend. Looking and feeling good, 70s, not too humid, mixture of sun and clouds, and just a slight chance of a few storms by Monday morning. All right, thank you, Adam. Coming up in the buzz, we're going to tell you how Sonic is celebrating the solar eclipse. Hmm. Oh, yeah. It's in the buzz. In the buzz today, five generations of one Canadian family came together to celebrate their newest addition. 102 year old Josephine Campanella was receiving care at the hospital when she found out that her great granddaughter was in labor at the same hospital. And look at this. On Friday, Josephine met her great granddaughter, Macy Josephine Heller, named in honor of her great great grandmother. Congratulations to all. That's pretty special. All right, Sonic wants to help you celebrate next month's eclipse with <laughs> this. It's kind of weird looking. Even if you aren't in the path of totality, you can still get one of these. The fast food restaurant launching a limited edition drink called the Blackout Slush Float. It's black color, celebrates darkness from the eclipse, but what does the celestial event tastes like. Well, according to Sonic, they drew inspiration from the big top of the tropics. It's described as cotton candy and dragon fruit. That's a weird combo. The beverage is topped with white soft serve and blue and purple galaxy themed sprinkles, and everyone who buys one gets a free pair of eclipse glasses to watch it safely. It seems like there should have been some sunny D in there. Ta. Ah. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Turn your mouth black. Maybe they don't have it at Sonic. <laughs> Did, are you get would you try one of these? I mean, I'd try it, but as a sip and I'm out, probably. All right. Ugh. We'll be right back. Damp and drizzly tonight, then some sunshine midday tomorrow, followed by a few isolated pop-up storms. Whatever develops could be strong to severe, otherwise pretty quiet. All right, thanks, Adam. Thank you for watching the News at 6. Gee, I'm the night beat at 10.